Hello and welcome back to the Preparing Your Enterprise for Windows 10 as a Service Jumpstart. Uh, we're just taking a break and uh, we've, uh, we've come back to our next module which is going to be around staying current uh, with Windows. This was due to be uh, the penultimate module with one more module at the end. Unfortunately, due to some unforeseen personal circumstances, we've actually lost our presenter for that last section. So we're going to try and actually record that separately, maybe add it into the on-demand version or even have it as a completely separate video that you can watch uh, a little bit later down the line. So very deep apologies for that. Um, nothing we can do about it at this point in time because we are uh, live in this room. Um, Michael, when we start to, oh, and one more thing, we're going to actually have a, um, a section uh, to replace that where we're going to answer as many of the questions as we can that come in through the Q&A as, uh, as we possibly can. Please keep asking those questions. Even if you're watching this on the replay, you'll be able to have those questions answered, hopefully by some of the moderators who are inside of the chat. So Michael, staying current with uh, Windows 10, um, what, are we, uh, what are we kind of covering through the course of this section? What we really want to talk about is how we're evolving the way we deliver Windows. Mm -hmm. In the past, we've done a new release of Windows every three or so years, and that just meant that you had to wait that long to get new capabilities. Now we need to be able to deliver capabilities faster because mm -hmm. of new security threats, because of new employee scenarios. The way that people are using PCs is different today. so. We want to be able to get new capabilities out to the people who need them much sooner than that, uh, to the point where we want to be able to deliver updates frequently to Windows, adding new features, new capabilities, even two to three times a year. And I guess a lot of this is based on the fact that we've had quite a lot of feedback that we need to be, we need to make Windows more agile, more capable and able to, to respond to, that, um, to those kind of pressures uh, yeah, a little bit more quickly. And certainly with uh, the changing security environment, with these new institutional attacks that are much more sophisticated than what's been done in the past, being able to deliver new security features quickly is key for most organizations because they're telling us that they're constantly having to deal with new threats. So as we come up with new technologies to address those threats, we can add those into Windows and deliver them two to three times a year along with other functionality. That's not to say that we're just delivering security cap capabilities. We're also adding productivity features and uh, other capabilities at the same time. But the goal is to really provide an ongoing cadence where we come out with new capabilities as, as we develop them eff effectively. So we want to get to a point where we can provide customers with new capabilities as quickly as they can handle them, and at the same time provide them with new ways of deploying those and managing those. As organizations overall, they really want the new capabilities, but at the same time they also want control. They want to be able to manage how those updates are deployed. They want to be able to test those inside of their own organizations. They want to be able to deploy them on their own schedule. So those are kind of different goals that providing much more agility while providing controls kind of contradicts itself to a certain extent, but we think we can develop something in between that provides the best of both, that we can balance the tension and provide additional capabilities to businesses and organizations to let them take new capabilities, but on a, a more relaxed schedule. One of the things I want to just pull out there is that some of that agility is actually having transparency over the, the roadmap and knowing what it is that we're doing before it actually lands in the hands of, um, of kind of all of your end users inside of your organization. And that's one of the reasons why being part of the Windows Insiders program is a really important thing for people to do because it gives you that early access into the roadmap. Uh, so when we're starting to think about delivering Windows as a service, we can all kind of very quickly picture um, the consumer devices that are out there. Um, but we've also got a whole ton of uh, devices which are not necessarily um, as suitable for that consumer type of environment of rapid update. Right, yeah, with the consumer devices, They've almost grown accustomed to new functionality. They expect it with 
uh, all kinds of different devices, new functionality continues to be delivered. So Windows will be no different. That will pr provide new upgrades to these devices to add capabilities on the fly two to three times a year. But for these specialized systems, the things that control machinery and medical equipment and uh, really keep operations going, well, those are not a good candidate and need to be treated differently and we'll be sure to address those differently. It's really what's in the middle that becomes more interesting. How can we provide something in the middle for businesses to do both? So that's where we're at. We want to be able to provide additional capabilities for businesses so they can get new functionality while still having the flexibility for these critical systems to get long-term support for security updates only. So in terms of what kind of ways you should start to think about treating um, those devices inside of your uh, your business, I guess with the consumer devices, updates, you're going to kind of see those apply very quickly onto those machines? Yeah, pretty much as the new features have completed the insider process, they're ready to be deployed to consumer devices. So they will go out to all of them and all the consumer devices will be upgraded. For the other types of devices, then we've got uh, additional delays built into the process to allow additional time for testing and validation. Specialized systems on the opposite end of the spectrum, those, yeah, we don't want to add any new features at all. For those, we'll just deliver additional security updates. But really for those, being locked into that means that the devices overall are uh, more trouble to manage, they're more expensive to operate. Uh, so you really don't want too many of those. We want to limit the number of those in an organization to just the devices that are truly critical. Yeah, and I think we'll see a little bit more on the how the how different the long-term servicing branch is a little later, and how actually it will require quite a bit more management to to keep things steady on that uh, on that particular path. Um, I think the other thing as well, which we kind of tend to um, forget quite a lot is that actually all of the people inside of our organizations are consumers and as a result they actually have over the course of the past five years or so um, they've become really used to being able to update their own applications we don't really necessarily inside of the IT department give them as much credit as they're really due that they actually can cope with change now yeah and it's amazing going back just a, a few years and seeing how people would react to small changes like we would change the background color or the start menu would change a little bit from Windows XP to Windows 7 and there would be enterprise backlash saying that their their users just won't be able to figure it out, that it looks too different, we want to make it look like it did before. Mm -hmm. We've really moved from that to almost the exact opposite. Now that we have new people entering the workforce, they're used to having a personalized experience. They're used to having new capabilities delivered. And they actually look at those antiquated Windows 7 systems now as uh, a negative. Yeah. They will look at employers that aren't running the latest and greatest and think, oh, do I really want to go work for a company that's still running technology that's five and six years old? Yeah, I mean, it's, they're used to thinking in months, not in years. Completely, and it's, it's completely possible that they may have been through the entirety of, if you take a recent college graduate, they may have been through their entire college education and actually not touched a Windows 7 machine at all during that period. The, there's a good chance that, they, that the college may have actually had their machines upgraded to Windows 8. They were, may well just have had their own PC up, just running Windows 8 or 8.1 for that whole time, and they'll never have come across a Windows 7 machine. It's going to feel like stepping back in time for those people and there is a very good chance that that might be one of the um, things that as they have so many options around where they're going to actually go and work they might actually be thinking huh i'm not sure that i want to go and work for a company that's running an operating system which doesn't quite work as i expect it to so right. it could cause some yeah so we certainly need to give the employees more of a 
more credit that mm -hmm. they are able to adapt as these changes are coming out. And we're not talking about huge changes at once. We're not talking about building up three years worth of new features and dumping them on you all at once. We're talking about two to three times a year coming out with incremental new features, maybe a few big things added in there, especially around security and the, mm -hmm. the capabilities that enterprises are looking for. But it's not going to be a massive change for the users. They're going to see an evolution. They're not going to see just a sudden complete replacement of what they were used to. Yeah. And so let's, let's review the, um, uh, the area that Bill talked about a little bit earlier on around where the rings fit into each other. And maybe actually, I think we're going to extend beyond just the, the rings that we think about from an insider's point of view. So um, we start off with um, driving quality from the engineers actually using uh, the operating system themselves. Right, yeah, they definitely need to feel the pain. So mm -hmm. as each daily build is created, it's deployed broadly inside of Microsoft. After we've passed the Canary test, we can then expand out more broadly inside of Microsoft to pretty much anyone inside who's willing to test it out. After it's gone through that type of validation, then we can finally make it available to the insiders. So the insiders will go through a work in progress. They'll be trying out new capabilities as they're being written. That process, the, the actual development time varies, but it could be four to six months spent on a new upgrade working on new capabilities that will then be released to the current branch. So current branch is a much broader population of hundreds of millions of machines, both consumer machines and potentially some organization machines as well, where they get to use the new capabilities. For organizations, they can also do validation. They want to make sure that those new capabilities work well in their environment. They want to make sure that the OS overall is compatible with their apps, their websites, and that kind of thing. And then after they've grown comfortable with that, then they can expand bro more broadly. Mm -hmm. That's where Current Branch for Business comes in. They can leverage Current Branch for Business to do a, a wide deployment of the new capabilities within their organization. That's not to say that it all happens on one day, that we want to enable capabilities where you can build your own rings inside of there and be able to do a, a phase deployment inside of your organization. So initially starting out with pilots and early adopters inside the current branch, and then moving to current branch for business with broader populations. Now current branch, initially the releases come out, and then after a period of four months, we'll declare that these are ready for business and we'll make them available for current branch for business. Organizations don't need to deploy on that date. You'll also be able to defer those for an additional, at least another eight months before they, they need to be deployed. So uh, all total for each new set of functionality that we release, you have four plus eight, so 12 months to get those new capabilities deployed. And in terms of how you move yourselves into the rings, we actually, um, it's remarkably simple from a, <laughs> from a single machine point of view, and actually to, in order to be able to move into current branch for business, um, the checkbox. <laughs> it is a checkbox, yeah. We've gotten to the point where it's inside of the settings application under Windows Update under Advanced. There's one checkbox that says defer upgrades. You check that box and you instantly get a four-month deferral. So that's all it takes. That can be done per machine. That can also be done via group policy. So you can configure a group policy for a group of machines to do the same thing. Now, if you're using WSUS or Config Manager, which most organizations are doing today, they don't really have any impact. That setting's not going to suddenly change anything because the upgrades aren't going to be deployed out until they've been approved by the IT administrator anyway. So that setting is really for machines that are pointing directly to Windows Update and getting those updates directly from Microsoft. For those running WSUS, for those running Config Manager, you choose at what point during that 12-month window you want to deploy to each set of machines. Could be within the first four-month current branch window, it could be within the next eight-month window. 
you don't want to push it off completely to the end because after that full 12 months has gone by, subsequent security updates will then be dependent on the new upgrade that's come out. So in order to continue to receive those security updates, you'll need to upgrade to the latest release. Yeah. So you're always going to need to be within 12 months in order to be able to get the latest updates. Um, so in terms of, um, you just hinted that the, um, the, the defer updates option pays more, is more kind of useful for when you're pointed to Windows Update. We also have more control there as well with Windows Update for Business coming along uh, in the future. Yeah, so Windows Update for Business is a new capability that we want to provide. Some of it will be available now, some of it will be delivered in subsequent releases. So it's definitely a work in progress and a, a longer term goal really to provide kind of the cloud-based equivalent to what you would do today using WSUS or Config Manager. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to replace what you're doing today. If you're using WSUS Config Manager and you're happy with it, great, you can continue on. But we will be adding more capabilities to Windows Update for Business to make it roughly the equivalent, but without you needing the infrastructure yourselves. Today, with what we've delivered in Windows 10 initially, we provided peer-to-peer -peer delivery capabilities so that we can download the bits and then have one machine share it with others to save internet bandwidth. And we've also provided the controls around current branch for, versus current branch for business. So those capabilities are there today, but we do expect to provide additional features over time to let you define your own rings, to let you do uh, scheduling and maintenance windows and other capabilities like that. So we will be beefing that up as we move forward down the line. We also know that we need to work out scenarios where we integrate Windows Update for Business with WSUS and with Config Manager so that they can work together so that it's not necessarily an either or discussion. So being able to tie them together and leverage the best capabilities of both would be um, a key for us as well. And it's, um, I think the, the key thing there is that it puts you back into, you have control over all of this. You have always got control over what updates are going to be applying to what operating systems and when, and you get the ability to defer to a certain length of time as well, which is kind of good, but it also has the um, that kind of extra kind of need there to make sure that updates do actually apply over a, over a reasonable period of time as well. Um, right. When we start thinking about the mechanics of um, Windows Update for Business, we've obviously, as we've said, we've got things like Configuration Manager, WSUS, um, and even third-party utilities, which are still going to be able to um, manage updates and manage updates directly from coming from, flowing down from Windows Updates, probably caching them in an on-prem environment somewhere, and then flowing through to Windows Client. Yep, but so all that continues to work fine. Uh, you can continue to use your existing tools. We'll introduce Windows Update for Business initially so that you could have clients pointing directly to Windows Update in the cloud uh, to download updates directly from Microsoft. Uh, in parallel to that, we also have mobile device management. And if you haven't looked at the MDM capabilities that are present in Windows 10, we've added Windows Update control so that a solution like Intune, uh, an MDM service like Intune, would be able to approve updates the same way that WSUS does. So you can specify when a new update comes out, even though this client machine may be pointing directly to Windows Update to receive updates, uh, only approve it, only deploy it once I've approved it. So we'll, we have that capability coming soon in Intune. Uh, the platform capability is there for other MDM vendors to leverage as well. But we will be then integrating that with Windows Update for Business to uh, really link those two together as well. So there is the, a grand plan. We're still trying to flesh out the details and the timeline for that, but we will be delivering that over time. And this is one of those things like the operating system where we've started building services. It gives us that ability to over time iterate, build more components and build more, um, as we're starting to build them out, build more stability into the platform and deploy things as and when they become just the right thing to do. So we've just taken a walk through um, Windows Update for Business and how that's going to interplay with a bunch of the other uh, on-premises services. Um, just to mention some things around uh, application and device compatibility again and how Windows as a service is going to kind of play in with those. Yeah, which is kind of what we had talked about just starting off this morning, that mm -hmm. Windows as a service and deployment really intersect. So 
we need to make sure that we can continue to deliver strong hardware compatibility, software compatibility, and web compatibility. So maintaining that as we go forward with updates, upgrades two to three times a year is going to be key for us. So we've talked about the different categories of devices. You have got consumer devices that are always up to date, specialized systems on the other end of the spectrum that you don't want any new functionality for, and business users sitting in the middle who need faster access to new technology, but with time to test it and validate it in their environment before it's broadly deployed. So that's what we provide with Windows as a service. But that doesn't mean that you want every single system in one bucket or the other. So you really need to be able to choose a mix that makes the most sense for your organization. So we're trying to enable that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about kind of the expected breakdown as we move forward. Yeah. So what we're really thinking with Windows 10 and Windows as a service is we can reduce the overall cost of operating a Windows environment by enabling these types of scenarios. We can simplify the deployment process using in-place upgrade. We can make sure that we maintain high app compat and provide new dynamic provisioning capabilities. So we can take those costly upgrade projects and shrink those down to size. We can provide new cloud-based options with Windows Update for Business, Azure Active Directory, and MDM so that you can do uh, mobile fleet management for organizations that aren't tied to a, a particular on-prem infrastructure. And we can improve the overall security of devices through all of the updates that we're releasing by coming out with new upgrades two to three times a year and monthly cumulative updates, we can make it easier for you to manage your Windows environments. So we've obviously been talking with a lot of customers and analysts and press and others, getting them used to the idea that Windows 10 is coming and it's going to change the way you think about Windows. It's Windows as a service, it's Windows being updated continually. So uh, through some of our conversations with analysts like uh, Steve Kleinhans with Gartner, we're, we're starting to see an image of customers that initially might be a little hesitant and saying, maybe I start off with long-term servicing on larger populations of machines and then over time shift to current branch and current branch for business. But that's not necessarily how it has to be. So some organizations are going to look at this today and say, yeah, I can see how my PCs can fall into that current branch for business bucket and I can put a significant percentage of my machines in the situation where they're going to get new upgrades two to three times a year, but deferred four to 12 months before those updates are actually deployed. So that's really what we want to enable. When we look at the actual details of what this ends up looking like, you get different pictures based on the, the branch that you're working on. So Insiders is probably the one that people are most familiar with, that we release new builds to the Insiders a few times a month so that you get new features uh, and previews of those features as we're developing them. So over time, you're just kind of following along in the path. With current branch, we periodically release new capabilities, two to three times a year. So you're not getting things new every day, you're getting things new eh, maybe after four months. You get a new upgrade that moves you forward on the line to add new capabilities. Current branch for business then really just extends that. So instead of after four months jumping up to the, the current point in time, you can choose to go another eight. So you can defer that and do more of a staged deployment throughout your organization. That probably doesn't mean waiting the full additional eight months for every machine in your organization because then it's too much to do at once, too much risk, too much network bandwidth, if nothing else. So you're probably going to do a much more gradual deployment. 
that's why we've talked about being able to do your own rings and providing new capabilities in Config Manager and WSUS and uh, Windows Update for business to make that much easier to do. When we talk about long-term servicing then, first we had to really look at this as something that's very different. We've got insider builds, which become current branch builds, which become current branch for business builds, and you can kind of move where you're at along that timeline. Long-term servicing, though, is separate. So periodically, we create a separate long-term servicing release of Windows, which we've said we'll do uh, probably 18 to 36 months. So every so often, certainly not as frequently as we'll be releasing new functionality to current branch, but these would be separate images that would be deployed out to machines. It would have the current set of Windows functionality and nothing more would be added until you leap forward to the next current uh, long-term servicing branch release when it comes out. So you're basically committing yourself to staying with that set of functionality for as long as you want up to the full uh, 10 year or so life cycle that we have for the long-term servicing branch. But you also then can choose at various points to upgrade to a later long-term servicing branch to get new capabilities. Maybe you skip one, uh, depending on where you're at in the cycle, when you deploy, when the new ones come out, you might even skip two. So you can, you can bounce forward, but uh, we really want most organizations to try to stay as current as possible. So we'll, we'll try to make it as easy as possible to go from the current long-term servicing branch to the next one by leveraging the same in-place upgrade process that we had talked about before. Mm -hmm. So if you were to actually compare the two, I talked about long-term servicing branch being different. And the easiest way to see the differences is to look at the start screen. When we have a, a typical Windows 10 enterprise installation and you click on the start button, you see all of the apps that are pre-installed. You see Cortana and Edge and the Windows Store. All of those are present. With a long-term servicing branch of Windows, all of those have been removed. So long-term servicing branch doesn't contain Cortana, doesn't contain the Windows Store, doesn't contain Edge, doesn't contain any of the other inbox apps because we can't offer long-term support for those applications. Those apps are tied to services running in the cloud. Those services continue to evolve. As a result, those apps wouldn't continue to work. Mm -hmm. Plus, you basically said you don't want new capabilities on these long-term servicing branch machines. So if we were to push out app updates, that's new functionality. That yeah. changes things. That has the potential to cause issues, which is why you're running long-term servicing branch in the first place. So we're removing all of that just to basically make it very clear that what's left in the operating system is what we're supporting for the long term. That said, the whole universal Windows platform is there on the long-term servicing branch. So you can build your own custom line of business apps. You can work with ISVs to get versions of their apps that they'll support long-term on an LTSB version of Windows, and they'll run just fine for that full duration. But the general use of the Windows Store and the inbox applications isn't something that we can guarantee on LTSB, which is why they've been removed. Which I guess could mean if you were if you had an ISB developed application, um, which uh, uses functionality, I guess let's just call it functionality A and functionality B, and then with a feature update we release functionality C. Then the ISV decides that that's the most important thing that they need, so they build functionality C into their operating system. You're on LTSB, which doesn't have access to functionality C it's just not potentially just not going to work going forward. So yeah, certainly the universal a, Windows platform continues to evolve as ISVs evolve their applications to leverage new capabilities. Then there's no guarantee that those apps will run on LTSB until some point in the future when there's a new LTSB that comes out with the latest universal Windows platform capabilities. So there are some 
concerns like that that you need to take into account, that you're certainly making a trade-off when you go to a long-term servicing branch installation, which is why we don't think that it's a very good solution for organizations to deploy broadly. It's great for those truly critical machines where you can't risk having any changes in functionality, but for most information worker PCs, you want more capabilities than that. So you have to think about this then to look at what do I put into each bucket? Mm -hmm. And you start off with machines that are on the insider branch. You as an IT pro want to be able to see the new features in Windows as they're being developed mm -hmm. so that you can try them out, you can provide feedback, you can see how they work within your organization. So you want some small percentage of machines on that. Might just be a few dozen machines. Yeah. But it gives you that key visibility into the new capabilities and a key avenue for providing feedback to us. After that period of time, uh, once a, a version of Windows has finished going through the insider preview process and it hits current branch, you may want some percentage of machines there as well. Those are your pilots. Those are your early adopters. Those are the machines that you can use to validate that the new functionality works well within your organization, that your applications work well on top of it, and allows you to really do less of the upfront testing like we had talked about this earlier this morning and instead just do validation in real world environments and let those early adopters and pilot users report on any issues that they encounter. So maybe that's a larger percentage, maybe that gets up to 10% of the machines in the organization. It's gonna vary by org, so some might do 5%, some might do 25%, some might do 100% if they want to be that type of cutting edge organization. Especially an ISV who's building applications themselves may want to have a significant uh, percentage of machines uh, in the current branch. But then we expect the current branch for business to be where the bulk of machines would reside. So we'll have significant percentages of the machines there, maybe even 80% of the devices inside of an organization. After the capabilities have been previewed, after they've been validated using the pilots and early adopters in the current branch, now the larger percentage of customers can, uh, of users can get those in the current branch for business. For current, for long-term servicing then, after a period of time, we release a, a long-term servicing branch release, which we did initially with the Windows 10 RTM yeah. because we had a longer than normal development and stabilization process. But maybe for an organization, it's 15 to 20% of machines, but going to vary based on what your organization does. If you're a manufacturer, factory floor machines, great for long-term servicing. If you're a bank, ATMs probably want to run long-term servicing. Uh, teller machines may run long-term servicing. But machines in the back office being used by the accountants and uh, customer service reps and more of the general population of the employees of the organization probably want to be on the current branch for business so that they can take advantage of the latest capabilities. So we can't really come out and say this percent should be in here, this percent should be there, this percent should be here because it's going to vary for each organization but we do expect all organizations to want to look at some machines in each of the buckets. Some on insider, some on current branch, some current branch for business, probably most and uh, a small percentage on LTSB. And so the, um, I guess it, we've got to that point where it's time for people to go do something. Um, <laughs> that's probably the, uh, probably the real thing. Um, number one call to action is probably to go and get hold of the, uh, the enterprise evaluation for um, Windows 10. Actually start, um, start using it, yeah, make sure that you're going through that process. And also join Windows Insiders to, uh, to have access to the earlier bits when we start to release the um, the next set of updates, the next set of upgrades for Windows uh, for Windows 10, they're going to come through to Insiders first. You'll be the first people to have hands on with those, and you'll be able to start that process as early as possible as to understanding as to when you want to deploy those bits inside of your organisation. 
Um, building a lab to test in place upgrade is probably the, um, the next first step for, for IT guys out there is actually to get hold of the, uh, the hardware you need, probably inside of a bunch of VMs is a good way to go, and start to actually um, put things together and start testing through the process of doing in place upgrades, make it so that you're familiar and comfortable with it. Yeah, for most organizations, until you've tried it, mm -hmm. uh, don't discount it. I mean, yeah. A lot of people are scared about in place upgrade. They look at the operating system and say, I just don't know about it because it's going to take all of the garbage that's, that's accumulated in that existing OS and move it forward to Windows 10. Well, we do a pretty good job of it, so we know that we will lay down a new, clean Windows 10 operating system and then migrate your existing apps and data into that. So if your applications were working well on Windows 7, they should continue to work well on Windows 10. So try it out, do a, a population of machines using in-place upgrade, build your comfort with that, build your uh, experience with that, and then take the step back and see now, how am I going to do the broader deployments? Yeah, how do we start getting there? And then the next thing, um, begin to test your line of business apps, your um, browser-based apps, particularly for compatibility. Make sure that, they're, um, they, that things are, are working for you before you start to broadly push out, push out to the entire enterprise. Although we're going to have very high levels of compatibility, you don't want to be the guy that's pushing out the application that uh, actually makes it not work. Yeah, and, and certainly prioritizing the list of applications by most critical to least critical yeah. and working your way down the list to the point where you hit satisfaction. Mm -hmm is a great approach to take because we've had we've worked with organizations that were trying out the previews for Windows 10 and of course we tell them oh no you don't need to test everything but a lot okay. of them will anyway yeah. so we've talked with organizations that had 3000 apps they tested every single one of them three of them were broken mm -hmm. that's a pretty good ratio yeah. that's uh, an excellent percentage overall and even with the ones that were broken we can probably shim them or upgrade them to fix them so that's excellent results, but of course your results will vary and your level of risk will vary. So as you work your way down the list, you should get to some point where you say, oh, it's really not worth testing all of these because I haven't found any significant issues above this point. So I'll stop here and we're ready to start doing pilots. Yeah, and it's in, I think it's important to realize as well that unlike the, the traditional three year deployment pr process, as we're starting to move forward into a Windows as a service model, you're going to need to have that level of confidence on an ongoing basis. So you don't want to be in a situation where your organization has to spin up an entire project team and an entire test team in order to go off and do those, uh, all of that testing. You want to be in a place where you get uh, very comfortable over a long period of time with the, uh, with the process rolling through. Uh, and then finally, I guess you want, to, you want to be starting to profile your users so that you know which deployment option they're going to go into. Are they going to be your, um, your canary group? Are they going to be one of the people that, uh, that gets to have current branch? Are they going to be um, one of the people that ends up having current branch for business? Or is it such a mission, mission critical function on that particular device that they end up inside of the long-term servicing branch? Yeah, and keep in mind that it's fairly easy to move between current branch, current branch for business. It's really just a question of when you deploy a new feature upgrade to that device. So those are easy to adjust afterwards. Moving from current branch or current branch for business to LTSB or vice versa, much more involved. So you want to make sure that you've really thought that through before you start deploying machines. Yeah, absolutely. So that gives you guys a whole lot of options and it brings us to the end of the um, the kind of the formalized content that we're going to be uh, delivering today. Um, we have a, uh, a gentleman standing just behind the cameras with a very large roll of duct tape. And uh, if, he, uh, if he is able to successfully deploy the duct tape, then we're actually um, going to come back and uh, answer as many of the questions from the Q&A um, as we can for a short period of time. Desperately want to get those answered for you. Um, the questions that we don't answer, we're going to try and turn those into a blog post and get some of those questions answered um, en masse so that you can start to um, explore some of those answers a little bit more in the wild. So hopefully um, we'll have a little bit more information uh, in a couple of moments after we go off air. We're going to have a bio break. It could be that we don't come back uh, depending on the um, level of deployment of duct tape that's required. So stick around and uh, if not, we'll just let you know through the chat.